All right. Well, welcome back to uh, our second lecture from John Murs, this one on authorship and peer review. OK. So we talked around some of the issues already a little bit, but we'll try to make this fast. OK. So I'm going to talk about publication as well, authorship and peer review. So why do we publish? I'll just throw out some reasons here. To share with others. We talked about this before, about the norms of science disseminating, right? Um, it's basically also a condition of funders. Right? If you're going to okay, take money, you better put your work research out there. Um, I would say it's absolutely necessary when you use humans in research. You darn well better publish your results. Um, and, but the real reason in, so behind science is to facilitate replication, validation of their work, and, and extension of the work. Right? Um, you want to subject your work to critical review. Um, you have to establish reputation, thinking pra pretty pragmatically. Um, you can assert priority. Right? I was the first. In fact, you know, sometimes you know, you know, it's one of the games people play. You, get, you don't necessarily get priority depending where you are and under what circumstances you publish. And publish, publication, publication takes lots of forms, including standing up at a meeting and saying something. And it's something to think about. Um, you can get community recognition, and there may be a condition for promotion. Obviously, it is. Right? And finally, to teach. We're teaching the world, essentially, what it is we've done. And then most pragmatically, it's publish or perish, and he hasn't published. <laughs> So there's various problems in publishing. And we talked about some of these early in the earlier session. One is publication bias. right? And this is what and Rosenthal called um, the file drawer problem. The issue here seems to be that you know, there's this perception on the part of authors that there's an editorial bias towards not publishing um, new and, 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 and interesting stuff um, and not negative results. Um, and because of that, then when you get negative results, you don't write it up and submit it. All right. Editors, whether or not that editorial bias really exists, is 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 contra is, is is it's not clear. Um, it's pretty clear, though. Merely duplicative or confirmatory results are not as interesting to journals as are contradictory results or something that's totally new. Right. So, if there's a paper published in na in Nature or Science, and then you duplicate it, you're second to du duplicate it. Science or Nature is not going to take it. Right. Which diminishes the the drive to actually do that du duplicative work. And the typical model, of course, is that you know, somebody does some work and you try to extend it. Okay. Another pop problem is what's called double, pu double publication. And this is essentially the same data in different outlets um, without acknowledgment of priority. So if you go off and you go, go to Japan and you have a scientific meeting and you present your data from a, a study that you've done, this is a publication. Right? And when you submit that paper to science, you darn well better tell them that you presented the results in Japan. It doesn't bar publication in science, right? And if you have a short paper in science and you want a longer exposition in a different journal, a specialty journal or something like that, then you go ahead and you submit it there and you tell them it's been published here in, in science and this is our more complete exposition. Right? It's totally fine. It's not double publication. Bubble, <laughs> double public. It's getting too late. <laughs> <laughs> You know what it isn't. Okay, so when th people are interested in double publication, have the frequency of it, and so the recent study by um, Arami and his colleague Garner um, suggested that two to three percent of Medline articles may be duplicates. Now, if you go to Medline, they've actually marked a du du duplicate publication. There's something like 700 out of uh, I forget 140 million publications on Medline that have been so marked um, as duplicates. Right. Um, so they did this kind of search with their little program, and they suggested that some maybe two to three percent seem to be overlapping. All right, um, they're still validating that. They're actually looking whether or not there's acknowledgments of priority and the like. And I think their number is going to be much lower at the end of the day. Um, and in the Martinson study, which I mentioned before, 4.7, so almost five percent of people admitted to publishing the same data in different outlets. Um, but that may not be double publication. Again, it depends if they're honestly acknowledging where the papers appeared first. Okay. Oops, wrong way. Some other problems. One is the ownership of data and the right to control publication. Right? <clears throat> it was a case, uh, Kanakin case, um, which I alluded to earlier. Um, a guy named Bluestone um, uh, was a researcher, clinician at, um, at the University of Pittsburgh. This is back in the 90s. He um, did research. It was NIH funded, but he also had millions of dollars from pharma pharmaceutical companies to study um, um, antibiotics, and he was specifically looking at childhood ch children with otitis media, earaches. And um, he published a paper in the New England Journal, and shortly after he submitted his paper to the New England Journal, 
Kantikin, who was a bioengineer, <coughs> who was his statistician on his, on his research, submitted an alternative interpretation of the data. And it turned out that bluestone, and there's a lot of interest in this because lots of kids get earaches, right? So, and, and how do we treat? Do we treat or not? So bluestone did a clinical trial, and he presented in his New England Journal submission, he presented four-week data that suggested that children who get antibiotics do better than kids who didn't get the antibiotics. Cantigan submits an alternative, kind of a competing paper to, to the New England Journal that sh shows eight-week data. At eight weeks, the kids aren't substantially better. So, New England Journal gets these manuscripts, they turn it around, throw it back to Pitt. Pitt, what does, it, what does Pitt do? You've all been heard about, blue, uh, about whistleblowers. What does Pitt do? Throw the book at Kanakin, right? They, have, they had a panel come together saying Kanakin had no right to the data, even though he's the statistician on the research, and he had no right to publish independently. Right? So that was probably the wrong thing. So he wound up actually being fired by the pit and kind of like accused of misconduct and all this other stuff. He wound up suing. He was offered a very large settlement. In fact, uh, a new lawyer who was on the, associated with the case, and they said basically make the case go away. And he rejected the, re the, the monetary settlement. He kept his job. But um, I re at least he kept his professorship at Pitt. But um, the, the issue really was what do you do with competing views and who owns data like this? I mean, he had a right as not the PI on the project, but as the statistician on the project to, to his interpretation of the data. It turned out that Bluestone had not disclosed to the NIH's competing interests, and Bluestone really was guilty of who knows why. I mean, some kind of misconduct. But it was all kind of like hidden behind the allegations against Kantikin. Anyway. anyway. Um, another issue, and this is kind of an embedded issue, is in industry sponsorship. Um, industry has a tendency to suppress unfavorable research results. Um, I already mentioned the kind of the idea that you could almost, you can hide hide your analysis. You know the Merck case. Um, there were three cases that t came up in the 90s that were kind of like flat, that kind of like raised this issue of commercial interests, kind of like actually you know, commercial entities actually coming through in very hard ways and um, coming down on individual researchers. So one was Synthroid and Betty Dong. Betty Dong was a researcher at the University of California, San Francisco. And she took money from, um, I think it was called Boots Pharmaceuticals, um, to do a study that she thought would show that Boots' Synthroid was actually, synth the, the, pharmacy, the drug Synthroid was actually more bioavailable than its generic competition. And this was worth millions and millions and millions of dollars to the company um, because there's lots of competing drugs out there. That's only one Synthroid, one, the original, right? And um, she published this data, so she submitted a paper at the end of the study, she submitted a paper to JAMA that said these things, these four formulations are bioequivalent, right? That was in contrast to what the company wanted. It turned out that she had signed a confidentiality agreement with the company that gave her the money for the, con for the, for the research. Um, they came down on her, threatened lawsuit. Um, she pulled the paper after, after it had been accepted by JAMA but not published. She pulled the paper from JAMA. The company took the data massaged it to make it look like they're better, right? published it into a, a C-tier medical journal that the, the medical director from the company was the editor of. I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up, right? <laughs> and, um, and the reason, that, so they had threatened to sue her, and, and UCF didn't support her. I mean, she had no real or apparent authority to bind herself or the institution to a confidentiality of that nature. It's contrary to every kind of policy you can imagine for science to agree to that. And um, nonetheless, the, the UCSF was kind of reeling at the time the, the uh, president or something had been dismissed, and, and they had a lawyer who was acting, or maybe the chief counsel or something, was acting as president, and they were just taking very conservative positions, so they just backed away from it. And as I, a faculty member, I thought the faculty should have actually been up in arms about that. They should have actually thrown up, you know, this is the obligation to protect academic freedom, right? They should have been in, up in arms over this and thrown that person out of, out of office. But they didn't. Um, it did come and finally came full circle. Um, and actually, the FDA wound up getting involved. Trial lawyers got involved. The trial lawyers sued um, the, the, this Boots Pharmaceutical for, um, for basically kind of like taking the American public because of the fraudulent research and all. And JAMA, interestingly enough, JAMA wound up publishing the paper years later with, an exp with, a, with a description by Drummond Rennie, one of the editors, saying this is why we're publishing this duplicative data. Right? It's appeared someplace before, but it was massaged, and it's not legitimate. This is the true data, which is very interesting. Um, the other cases I don't have really time to talk about, but if, you, if anybody's interested in them, David Kern was a, an environmental scientist at Brown. He, um, he also signed a confidentiality agreement. He went into a company. turned out that the company was owned by a family, a long-term Brown contributing family. In fact, the president of the company um, was on Brown's board. Um, 
and he found out that the flock workers were getting lung disease, right? And he published this. And the company basically, in fact, the university defunded his department and closed his department. You know, he had tenure, so he wound up staying at Brown, but um, somehow. Um, but it was this whole craziness that's like, well, how, you can't do that, right? Anyway, and Nancy Oliveri is at, at, at Toronto, and uh, Epotex, she gave her money to, fun, to study um, a treatment and on, on the market treatment for beta thalassemia. And she showed that there was liver, liver problems in these children who were being treated with this, this drug. And um, that was, they didn't want that published. So they also asserted that there was a, come up, there was, there was a confidentiality agreement there. Um, and they also basically, they had an agreement to buy a $20 million building for the University of Toronto at the time or something like that. So Toronto totally kind of like capitulated. But there was that, that, that case, I'm not even sure where that case went. Anyway, and I mentioned earlier, human subjects research. If you're going to use humans in research, you better darn well publish it. Um, and there's been uh, in the past uh, concerns over non-publication and the need to account for negative results, especially in systematic reviews or meta-analyses in medicine. And um, this led to Kirk Hall's really starting in the 70s and 80s for registration of tr clinical trials. So when you're doing a meta-analysis, you know where to look. You can find which trials have been started, at least if not completed and published. And it's a way to kind of also kind of correct for and find the negative results. Um, so. In response to those calls, clinicaltrials.gov is a registration, a registry of uh, run by the NCI, I believe, but it's all clinical trials. Um, the Institute, the International Co Co Committee on the, of Journal of um, that's MJE, not JME, International Council of um, Medical Journal Editors requirement that trial registration is now a, a necessary precondition for trial uh, for publication of a study has also led to trials being published, which is a great thing because in some sense what the journals do, it's kind of like a push me a pull mechanism, right? If you want to get published here, you better darn well register your clinical trial, so and it's working. It was also in New York, there was a clinical, there was a, a lawsuit by the Attorney General of the state of New York against GlaxoSmithKline and it compelled Glaxo to actually reveal uh, um, the clinical trials that they have um, ongoing. And they set up a clinical trials registry and it's there. Um, you can look at it yourself. But uh, other drug companies are moving in the same way. They're essentially putting this information out there. GSK is also, I mean, whatever the trial results are, they will put a summary of their trial results up on that website. More problems, poor citation practices. So th essentially, and this speaks right to the failure to give credit to those who went before you. You know, you give credit where credit is due. Um, I ran into one recently, I was a peer reviewer, and it was like, these guys aren't really citing the relevant literature. It was on psychiatry and conflicts of interest, in fact. And it, and it was like, you know, there's a rich literature out there. And in, I suppose when you run into this problem, it's like, well, who do you cite? And the, the editors basically said, no, you have 70 papers. You can only have 70 references. And I thought that's kind of like, depending on who the authors decide to, to cite, they're leaving people out, necessarily leaving people out, right? So that's one constraint. But people also game this, and they're dishonest, and it's not necessarily, it's not always picked up. And even when it is picked up, it's not necessarily um, respected by, the author, by authors and editors, right? Um, and I think it really undermines the intellectual honesty of the work and the heritage of the work, I'll call it heritage. One example, for instance, a couple of years ago, I was a peer reviewer on a paper for science, and um, the, these, the, the paper basically looked at, it was a really neat paper, it basically looked at, uh, they took the patent database on human, genome, uh, human genetics uh, um, uh, patents and, um, and the, the human genome database itself and married them, right, compared them. And then I think it was the only restriction on it was looking for base, like strict strings in both databases more than like 20 or 50 base pairs long. So it was like necessarily kind of ex uh, excluding smaller, smaller fragments. And, um, well, what they, what, but, but what they did is they so showed that, you know, essentially 20%, give or take, take of human known human gene sequence was patented, right? And then they, they did really neat analyses showing that most of these sequences came out of, like, useful genes like breast cancer and stuff like that. It was a really neat study. But one of the things that I found interesting was is that, A, we know that most genetic discovery happens in universities, right? important thing, and that comes out of the, the prior literature. And in fact, those prior reviews, including one by myself, showed that around 15 to 20 percent of university inventions are patented. So you'd think that something coming out and showing that 20 percent of human genes patent are patented, you'd expect them to cite two papers that said 15 to 20 percent of, 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 of university discoveries are patented. So I pointed that out as a, as a good little peer reviewer and didn't make it into the final. So I am always wanted to know what the author argued not to cite that, anti that anticipatory work. You know, it's like you have to distinguish it somehow, and then why would you? I mean, it doesn't, doesn't undermine the value of that publication at all, and it just instead obscures what that signal is. Right. Anyway, 
I have some other examples. And sometimes it's downright gamesmanship, and it gets really offensive. I've had two papers that were fairly leading papers. In fact, one was on gene patenting, um, was published in Science, and one other, and then we had a, a second paper that was more thorough exposition in another journal. We actually won a money battle, and so I'm checking out a personal personal experience here. We won a money battle to get money to, sp to fund this little study, and it was an interview study with. Um, licensing executives at universities and at companies dealing with human genetics. And the NIH, the NHGRI, the National Human Genome Research Institute had come out and said, we want to fund this kind of research, um, asked for it. And I was told I was conflicted because I had basically argued that gene patents were bad, right? So I couldn't do it. So when I had another grant, we asked for a special supplement, which the turnaround is about two weeks, right? We got the money, we did the survey. The other people submitted their, their, their funding this is going on the web, isn't it? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> anyway, they, in their final paper, their paper showed up. So they actually ran into us because they were using an overlapping sample for their surveys. They ran into us because these people that they were calling had already responded to us. I don't care if they know. <laughs> and um, they published their paper three years after our papers appeared. And they published theirs in Nature Biotech, which I can go on for hours criticizing Nature Biotech and conflicts of interest. And they didn't cite us. And you know, only wag my finger at them. <laughs> that's dishonesty. That's all, that's all it is. Anyway, um, other issues is plagiarism. So I mentioned earlier, Martinson's survey found that some you know, one percent or more admitted to actually plagiarizing, which is bad. Um, and then finally, we get issues of authorship. And this is probably I don't know how many of you've authored papers yet, but authorship is one of the most contentious issues that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis because it's essentially it's the most fundamental form of credit. Right. You have ideas, you put them into practice, and you put it in a paper, you want credit for what you've done. So what is an author? And this is, a, this is according to the ICMJE again. This, is my, this time I got the MJE correctly. Um, authorship credit should be based on substantial contributions to conception and design, um, acquisition of data, or analysis and interpretation of data, um, drafting of the article or revising it critically for important intellectual content, and final approval of the version to be published. Those are the three elements. So a lot of journals now, um, not a lot, but some journals bas basically kind of like systematize what you sign when you kind of like agree to be an author on a paper, and it's those three things, right? They'll ask for at least those something along those lines. Um, some journals are still kind of like kind of wishy-washy about it, but a lot of journals have moved down this pathway, which I'll talk about. So this doctor says, Mr. Wilkins, I believe that your condition is going to get us both into JAMA. I have a tendency to think that one is going to be an author and one is not going to be an author. <laughs> <laughs> so some problems with authorship. First, there's disciplinary differences right, in determining who is an author as well as authorship order. So if, for instance, in, in some fields, uh, single authored papers are the coin of the realm. Right? If you have multiple authors in a paper, you don't get credit for it as when you're coming up for tenure. Take sociology and the like. Um, in some fields, obviously, it's single, single you, know, you do the bulk of your research by yourself. And that's been changing in lots of fields over, the t over time. Um, but in some fields, I know that people will actually game the authorship because they know that if there's too many authors on a paper, it, they, it doesn't count as much. Right. Um, in medicine, it used to be that anybody who wants to be on the paper and had anything to do with it would be an author. And that practice has essentially stopped. And we'll talk about that more. Um, disciplinary differences in order. I mean, arguably, the best order is he or she who has contributed most gets order ranked, right? Um, not in medicine, biomedicine, it's he or she who got the funding and it was the intellectual powerhouse behind the work, the lab, di the lab director and the like gets the last authorship. And in fact, at Penn Medicine and in, in medicine generally, when you're coming up for tenure, they look at your six years, eight years, or nine years, whatever it is it's been, and they expect to see you segue from a first author to last author, which means that you're now bringing in funds, you have people working for you, they're generating the stuff, and you're getting last authorship. That's the path. Right? Um, so the last author, in fact, they call them the last author is the senior author, right? Okay. So one of the things is that there's been an immutable, immutable escalation in the number of authors, especially in biomedicine. And this is in part driven by the pressure to publish or perish, right? Um, there's a perception that they have increased publication requirements for promotion. And I don't know how accurate this is, but I know that people got, used to get tenure here with one R01 and you know, 20 to 30 publications. I know people who came up for tenure here with uh, one, two equivalent or ones or more, and 60 or 70 peer-reviewed publications, and didn't get ex didn't get tenured. Um, 
there's a greater volume of multi-institution, multidisciplinary research. So the studies that are being done are much larger, so the number of authors is, is, has increased. I think one of the records was a, a multi-center trial published in the New England Journal um, that had, I think, 2,200 authors. Right? And it was everybody clinically kind of associated with this, anybody who'd enrolled patients and stuff. And um, it was, you know, they had, in fact, they didn't even put in the journal, they didn't put all the authors, they put it on the web. <laughs> this is too much. Um, and finally, one of the things to think is, is the greater number of authors dilutes the contribution and responsibility of any one author. You know, the, that 2,200 authors, I think there was one author um, for the consortium, right? Arguably, that one author hopefully was kind of like responsible for everything that was in the manuscript. But who else was responsible for anything in that, right? Anybody's guess. So this guy's, well, there was people who walking down the hall, and he says, things have become so hectic these days that I don't even have the time to read the articles for which I'm listed as first author. <laughs> So more problems. So the games that scientists play with authorship, right? And, and um, a paper by Rennie and Flanagan some years ago in JAMA that actually led to the new model that we have for policing this, um, they discussed um, three categories of, of kind of bad practices. One was ghosts, guests, and grafters, the three Gs. Ghosts are writers who are not included as authors and are not acknowledged. So this happens with drug company sponsored stuff. In fact, there's lots of press on the last couple of years about drug, you know, about ghost writers for, for, for pharma. These are Basically, the writing houses of professional writers who will write the science up and um, and submit it off to the send it off to the author to the to the real authors and the authors kind of like approve it or not make maybe make some line edits and the like and then it goes back and okay guests are gratuitous additions this really goes on um, I actually found out when I was at Rand I'd, I had actually contributed to a one paper got added to a paper that after it had been rejected once I made some substantial contributions to it we changed the paper and sent it off and was accepted. So I'm an author on that paper. But then I found out that the senior author on that paper added me to a methods, like a statistics methods paper. Right? And he said, yeah, I figured you could use the publication. I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, I, I, yeah, yeah, I can't justify that. It was like, it's not, it doesn't show up on my resume, but if anybody does a medline, it's out there. You know? It's like crazy. And um, so gratuitous additions happen, just collegial. And then there's grafters. It's those who exact authorship in exchange for things like access to subjects. Now, this is one of the practices that's kind of hopefully been, been restricted somewhat. But it used to be, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll refer patients to you. If, if you get into the trial, then I, you, I, get, I get authorship. Uh, another one is proprietary reagents or probes. I know cases of people who basically gotten themselves. They provided reagents on patients to uh, another in research group. And actually, in one case, they found out through, uh, this guy found out through the, through the grapevine that a manuscript on the, on the results had been accepted by nature. And instead of calling the authors, his colleagues that he had shared his reagents with, he called the editors at Nature and said, you know, I provided that. And, the, and Nature added him as an, uh, as an author. Nature has now collaborated, has, has, I think, restricted their practices. But it, and in some sense, that might have been a power thing because this person was extremely powerful. Um, funding, you know, I brought in the funding, right? And therefore, I, I get last, Less dibs. The funniest case is one of the most prolific scientists ever was head of the Russian, the, the USS and the Soviet Union's um, uh, scientific apparatus. He had like 150,000 publications. Everything that went out had his name on it. <laughs> um, and then there's finally there's abuse of power relationships. I mean, you'll wind up in power relationships. Somebody says, I need a paper. I, 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 I gave you this idea. I want to work on this with you. And I, you know, make it so, right? And how do you actually put that off? And how do you do that in a nice way? And can you? Um, and the fundamental problem with it here is, is that authorship does not readily convey who is re truly responsible for the work. And it should. When you look at the byline of authors, it should tell you what's going on. Right? It should say who's done the most work here and like. And, like. and then really, really, the fundamentally, it's that everybody wants to take credit without necessarily accepting responsibility for the work. Right? Because the publications help our CV. So what's been done to fix this? I mentioned the paper by Rennie and his colleagues. Um, and Rennie Yank and Emmanuel actually suggested another, another model. Um, but essentially what we've seen over the last 15 years is greater oversight of authorship by journals. So many journals now require all authors to sign copyright assi assi assignments. It used to be in the old days that the, the journals didn't do that. They basically, you know, whoever the, the, the communicating author was, you trusted that person to get copyright assignments if they were necessary from their institutions and the like. And, um, and that was it. You know, you didn't question anything behind it. Nowadays, journals go whole hog. In fact, it's a royal pain in the neck. Even with JAMA, that's right here, require signed statements by people who are acknowledged, merely acknowledged. Um, I think I've used. Um, they may accept emails. I forget. 
But um, you essentially have to kind of go off and, and try to collect these before you submit a manuscript. And if you're in a race, and your colleagues are like distributed around the world or on vacation and other stuff, and you have to get their signatures, to, you know, I mean, literally it becomes this, you submit the manuscript like electronically, and then you start faxing these forms to JAMA. You know, it's just a royal pain in the neck. And it's because they, kid, they found that they couldn't trust people. So because of these concerns that I listed before, um, Drummond Rennie and, and uh, Linda Emanuel, and I forget the Yanks name, um, wrote this article basically saying, we need to move away from an authorship model towards a contributionship model. And unfortunately, because of copyright law, they said this model doesn't necessarily really work because you still need to have authors. Authors are still kind of like a statutorily defined term. Um, but what they did is, is they say, well, look, we come up with these statements to say what do each individual who's either an author or merely acknowledged in a paper has done. Right. And then at some point, it's going to help us explain the difference and we'll draw a line somewhere as between the authors and distinguishing between authors and non-authors. Right. And this is an open, explicit statement that details what each person did. Right. It's fair, right, because it's true. I mean, if it's true, it's fair, because right? it's basically saying, here's the list of things that matter for authorship. What did you do? It's precise because, you know, it's fairly clear. Did you work on the data? Did you do this? Did you, did you collect it? Right, right. Um, and these things may actually help assign authorship order. I mean, he or she who did the most gets authorship order. And then finally, it may discourage fraud. I mean, I had a colleague a couple of years ago who came from the University of Michigan, and he was like working on this paper that he had been working on for years, and there was this senior person who demanded be on the paper, a clinician. And he was like, you know, what do I do? You know, he didn't do anything, right? and what do I do about it? And I said, well, just send him the JAMA. And it wasn't, he wasn't submitting it to JAMA, but they said, just send him the criteria list. Let him sign it. If he's willing to commit fraud, in black and white, that's, that's, you can't do anything else. And it doesn't, as I said, at the end of the day, it doesn't really diminish your contribution. You're still first or last author, so what the heck. I and mean, if he's willing to commit fraud, you can't do anything about it, and in the future, don't work with him anymore. So that's what he did. He sent it to him, and the guy just went away. <laughs> so it's not a bad idea. Um, and what we have seen, in, at least in biomedical sciences, over the last 15 years, is wide adoption of this model. And it's a really good model. In fact, you're ever going to, when you get into co-authorship, do this early and, and do it, and, and just think about what it is that people, I mean, what your expectation for contribution is going to be, and at the end of the day, what did people actually contribute, and it can help, help you argue for correct authorship order and the like. Um, and I never used this until, and I had a paper, I had one paper that I have to tell you about, it was like, because we assigned authorship order fairly early in the process, and I didn't feel comfortable re-evaluating re re it, but it was this graduate student who did this study, and, and she had done this big study, and, talked to, and she did a lot of work. To, ultimately, we wound up interviewing 17 people, right? But it was like literally review of 600 patents and then kind of identify this big database and then shrinking it down and finally getting 17 people on the phone. And, um, and she wrote up like this 5,000-word thesis, graduate thesis, right? out of which I called a 1,500-word, one-page nature piece, a nature paper. And um, so she had gone off to, to law school, and I'd summarized it. Meanwhile, my other colleague, Miller Cho, had gone back to Stanford. So I was kind of doing this, and I, it was like, okay, intellectual contribution. She, my student did the most, I did second, Miller did the last, third, right? And so that's the way the or that's the way I assigned author, authorship order originally. And it was just kind of taking 5,000 words and making it 1,500 words and making it coherent. And okay, that's, that's fair. They came back and said, we'll take 600 words in one table. So now I had to take this thing and kind of con condense it more, and it became this mi major nightmare. And they accepted it, but there was the, I had fixed the authorship order, and I spent more time than, you know, Mildred, I should have been third author, you know, it was the senior author kind of thing. And it was just like, but I didn't feel comfortable opening it up and discussing it, and I guess I've always, if I had some way of doing that and trusting my colleagues to kind of like, I was just stupid, basically. And, and so, but I guess I'm, what I'm getting at is authorship is always negotiable, and you should feel comfortable, and you should be comfortable enough with your colleagues that you can open it up and talk about it. Okay, segueing to peer review. This is, the, this is the, this the, these issues at the speed of light. All right, peer review, you've got a paper by Burnham, which is kind of like presents the, the um, history of peer review. It's a, it's a really good paper, that's why I gave it to you. Um, but essentially, most peer review really developed in the last 100 years or so in response to growing volume and specialization of, 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 of journals. So the purpose of peer review is to assess, essentially, the importance of the research questions, relevance to readers and the like. I mean, if it's a funding, if you're doing refereeing, then it's the same. How important is this question? How much is it really worth to do? Um, the thoroughness of the background and citation for prior research. How is this grounded in the, in the research that went before, right? And how is it going to contribute to what we know? Um, the data collection analytic methods, are they appropriate? Are they, are they correcting for bias and, and the like? Um, the presentation and the writing is always an issue, right? 
Um, and finally, are the results and in, results in interpretations reasonable? Um, I mean, are they just are they are they kind of like within the bounds of what their study is showing? Um, this often runs into the journals because sometimes journals will try to get you to say something that's a little bit radical. They, journals want, especially in, you know, the, the journal publication is extremely competitive, and the journals are looking for flashy stuff too. Um, so you have to kind of make sure that you're not taking the taking the bait and, and make sure you restrict yourself to the bounds of your study. Right? And, and the goal, one goal of peer review is essentially to promote innovation in publication, right? We want to publish really cutting edge stuff, um, but it's in intention with the conservative nature of science. And nature, you know, it's like, is this trusting and it, are the methods accepted methods or are they doing something that's beyond? So, so Kasser and Campion some years ago um, summarized the view that peer review is arbitrary, subjective, and secretive, right? They didn't say that. They said many think this. Um, and many will recite experiences of getting both glowing, glowing, and I said glowing just because it was a cute word, uh, reviews on the same manuscript. And this is true. I mean, I had submitted a paper to social science and medicine some years ago, and one review said, this, is, this has already been written. It's been half-baked. Another, um, another review said, this is, this is the best thing that he or she, I think I know who the person was, that he, that he has seen written on the topic and deserves to be published. It's written well enough to be published in Science or Nature. Which they, you can't get further apart, right? <laughs> I was like, "What's going on here?" And um, and that's typical. I mean, uh, and sometimes editors, in fact, people have basically said that editors need to be more careful about it. I mean, if they get really disparate reviews, and they, editors will do this, they'll basically look at it and say, "Oh, there's something wrong here." So I had one paper years ago. One review was really great. And one really, one really just like. Yeah, there's nothing nothing new here, not, nothing worth publishing. Got a third review, and the third review didn't help him. <laughs> so he published it. Because um, you can always negotiate. That's one thing about authoring. You can always negotiate with the editors, almost always. Um, subjectivity of, of peer review reflects differing views, the training and skills of reviewers. So it's, uh, subjectivity in itself is not a bad thing. Right? I mean, in some sense, it strengthens the paper if you're kind of speaking to multiple audiences. Um, it does, however, open the door to politics, power, and abuse. And here we kind of just threw out the Robert Gallo case. Um, Gallo, um, the biggest one of the one of the allegations I think was, which was fairly true, was that he wound up getting a manuscript on uh, the discovery of HIV that was submitted to Science, and the Gallo was basically per proceeding down the path that HIV was one of his. So Gallo made a name for himself in the 70s, discovering HTLV, the human T cell lymphoma virus, and um, he figured that HIV was a variant of his virus, his virus, right? So he was barking up that tree, and Montagnier from France had basically submitted this paper to Science, and I believe that Gallo kind of like somehow got the galleys and kind of like as like some kind of peer reviewer or something, and managed to kind of like write HTLV into the background, um, basically kind of like self-aggrandizing himself. Um, anyway, so. Kasser and Campion also note the lack of training for this scientific activity, saying it's akin to clinical, the clinical see one, do one, teach one activity. Myself, I don't know if anybody's done, anybody done a peer review here? Just one. Anybody give you any training on how to do it? Mm, yeah, that's good. Mm, yeah. One yes, one no. Um, I remember when I was in graduate school, my, my advisor kind of handed me this paper and he said, why don't you peer review this? And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> and uh, he didn't really tell me. He just said, review it and tell me what you think. Okay. Um, anyway, so many have observed that the standards reviewers, and this is a general critique, have, the standards reviewers applied to judging the quality of others' work is much higher than they apply to their own work. And it's one, one thing, you just go into your career. When you submit a manuscript, this is your work. You know? I, know, I know authors who basically say that they will submit a manuscript. It's not ready for publication yet, but let's submit it and see what the peer reviewers say, and that will strengthen the paper. That is an abuse of peer reviewers. Right? So and early on, I actually had submitted a manuscript to, P, to, to doing the journal once, and it turned out that my, I was doing the data analysis, and my two people were, who were doing the data collection and stuff, we were confused. We were confused about which way was a positive or negative sign, and fortunately, it didn't get published. In fact, it didn't get a peer reviewed because I really had pie on my face. But they, they sent it back, and I said, let me just look at this again because something didn't make sense. And reviewed it, reanalyzed re it, and really figured out what the problem was. It was published in the, the American Journal of Public Health. But, and we fixed it. <laughs> but uh, I was always like, oh my God, if anybody even went back and looked at that thing that's in the archives of the New England Journal, oh my God. <laughs> um, and I just, I will not submit something that's half baked, not, not even half baked. It's almost, this is your work, this is your product. You have to be really take ownership of it. And, and what happens if they accept it and publish it, right? You have to be willing to kind of like take that. 
And when I get papers that are half baked, I just kick them back to the editors and this isn't ready for review yet. You know, don't, don't waste your time. Anyway, and it's really responsibility of the editors, but the editors, you know, they get, you know, the big journals get thousands and thousands of submissions. They may not spend that much time with it. They look at it, is this interesting to us or not? And then they just kind of throw it out to peer review if it is an interesting topic. And this is an overview of the peer review process. Um, essentially, authors, and this is, this, is, this is kind of idealized in some ways, but the authors, they basically will submit it to a journal. It goes through editorial review and they make a decision. Well, do we accept, do we re review it or not to review it, okay? Um, and, and the journals vary in this. For instance, JAMA will read, review 70% of submissions and accept 10% of those. Right? Science makes a much more stringent requirement. They'll, they'll peer review 10%, but accept 70% of the, 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 the submissions that way. So their editorial board maybe is much more um, careful or they're just much more, um, they're using a lot more discretion in the beginning to kind of like s to, to flesh stuff out. So if they reject, it goes back fairly quickly um, to the authors. If they decide to review it, they'll send it to some number of peer reviewers. I've had anywhere from one to, my, my times of papers, one to four peer reviewers, right? The peer reviewers are essentially making adv giving advice to the editors. Is this of good quality? Is it an interesting question? Uh, and the like. It goes back to the editors. They collect it. They look at the reviews. And they make a decision to reject it. They can accept it outright, which very rarely happens. Or they can go back and they can revise and resubmit. Sometimes this can be a minor revise, just kind of like tell us, you know, just kind of like how you're going to respond to these kind of comments, or it can be a fairly major revision. Um, it goes back to the authors, and the authors then have to kind of decide whether or not to revise it and resubmit it, or submit to a different journal. You know, this also happens on rejection. And one of the things that your authors do, and this is a major loophole that the, the scientific community could fix, but they haven't really chosen to, except for one journal in, in biomedicine, and that's BMJ, is when you, s when you get a paper back, a lot of authors will just take it and send, send it someplace else, right? And I've, I've seen, I've done peer reviews for journals, and then the paper appears you know, two, later, two years later in a C-tier journal, no, ed no addition, no revisions to it. And I think about this highly of the authors who've done that. That's that, that, not that much. <laughs> and it's like, so you had your colleagues, two or three of your colleagues, spend their time giving you substantive creed criticism of your paper and you're not going to respond to it. So BMJ, about two years ago, BMJ altered their policy, said if you've submitted the paper elsewhere, now we want to see the peer reviews. And, and we want to see your responses to the peer reviews. So what, what happens here is when it goes back to the authors, so you go back to the authors, revise and resubmit, it comes up here, and when you resubmit, they basically say, you have to respond. Tell us how you're responding substantively to all of the criticisms of the peer reviewers. And you go back and, you, you, and it starts an iterative process. So this goes back to the editors. The editors will consider, well, what do we do now? They can reject again. They can also send it out to the peer reviewers. They can send it out to new peer reviewers. Right? Um, some years ago, I actually had a paper submitted to JAMA. JAMA rejected. They had three, re three peer reviews, I think, two or three peer reviewers. And all the reviews, were, and they, all the reviews had a substantive error. And the problem was is that, and this is the paper that went ultimately in social science and medicine, all of them had a sub substantive error, and it was because the literature was replete with erroneous stuff that we were kind of correcting. And um, so I went back to the editors. I said, you know, you've got, your peer reviewers had some problems. Will you look at it again? They said, sure. So they basically said, um, respond to the peer reviewers and come back to us and with another submission. So we went through this by a different path, like this early rejection. Well, it was, I guess this was a reject, and we managed to get back into this. They sent it out to another reviewer who didn't give us a written, reject, written, written opinion, but they wound up not, not accepting the paper anyway. So anyway, this can be varied. If they can, in fact, they can, if they can choose, if they want, if, the peer, if, the, if it's minor things, they don't necessarily have to go to peer review again. Right? They can actually work around this process and st skip straight to here. And then it goes into publication. Um, and when it goes into publication, essentially they kind of like pr proofread it and they have an editor go through it and, and correct the language and then they'll, they'll typeset it. And then you as an author will get proofs, proofs and you've got a very short period of time to review those proofs, usually 36 hours or something like that, and get it back to them. Right? Don't go ahead and change all your data because then you look like James Urban. <laughs> Um, in, on the refereeing of proposals, it's not dissimilar. I mean, when you submit a proposal to someone like the NIH or something like that, the, um, the big difference is that there's no iteration for the most part, unless the, unless the funder really wants to, to promote something. Like with the NIH, you submit it, you get a score. If you choose to, re, you know, at the end of the day, you choose to resubmit or something like that, you've got two bites of the apple nowadays. Um, you can resubmit or not, and it'll go out to reviewers. The reviewers might be the same the second time, maybe not. And so it's similar in that, in that way. 
So some practicalities here, and this is no general order. Um, one is that, and I mentioned this earlier in the first talk, is this is an unfunded mandate. It's a time-consuming obligation of a membership in the scientific community. You know, this often happens when you don't have the time and the energy to kind of do this. You have other things kind of pressing on you, and somebody comes up and throws something, and we'll get an email, can you review this? in the next two weeks. <laughs> or if you're really lucky, can you review this in the next th 36 hours? You know, science actually has some journals for really hot stuff. They have this very expedited turnaround. And um, that means that you're really, really good when you get on that list, <laughs> I think. Um, so in some sense, you, I mean, you get something out of this, right? I mean, it, it's, um, I mean, this is a good thing because it gets you in, a, it's part of the reputation that you build in the community be recognized for, for the work you do. Um, the volume of requests varies greatly. Um, I usually typically get half a dozen a year that I do. I get a couple extra that I, I just may not do. Um, it's tied to your reputation and your specialty. The journals essentially will, the journal, the good journals will um, keep records of who you, you know, who's doing work in particular areas. Sometimes they look at the reference list. That's the best way for identifying potential referees. Um, look at the references and um, they'll ask you to do it. Um, but uh, the, then there's also one, one thing I didn't really put down here is, is that if you get onto an editorial board, well, actually, not even shortly short of that. So my colleague Mildred Cho is on the editorial board of Science, and she gets reviews regularly. She's just sent these things, and some of them are really fast turnaround, some not. Um, but she, I remember years ago I was out there visiting her. It's, she's at Stanford now, and she, um, and she had a review in her inbox, a review open on her desk, and another review in her outbox to JAMA. She did 16 reviews for JAMA that year. And that's a major commitment of time. And it's like, how could you, how can you do that? And for her, what did she get for at the end of the year? She got, you know, Gemma has the nice covers, and she got a, a picture, like a, a, a coffee table book of the of the covers of Gemma. <laughs> like, well, it's so sweet. Um, the time spent on reviews varies greatly. Um, people have basically shown that more experienced re re researchers pay, spend less time on the reviews. Um, but that doesn't necessarily matter because in, in, in some sense, if they're really that good, maybe they're, they're that much that, that good at kind of like detecting the issues. Some years ago, I, I, I got a, a paper from JAMA and I spent a lot of time reviewing it. I actually spent a several days, like three days reviewing this paper because it was near and dear to my heart. The subject matter was near and dear to my heart. Um, but I took it very, and I took it very seriously. In fact, I even signed that review and they took, them, they took the signature off, but that's another thing. And, um, but one of the other reviewers, so at the, and the good journals at the end of the day, what they'll do is, is the, for the peer reviewers, they will send you their decision letter and a copy of the rev other peer reviewers' reviews. And you should always review them. You should always look at them because it's basically a way to calibrate yourself. Was I, was I well-tuned here to what others did? In this case, so I sent this, I think it was a seven or eight page re peer review. Replete citations to the re literature and basically kind of like, that was just like, you know, rewrote re re the paper in a way. Anyway. And um, this other reviewer, kind of hand scribbled three comments down, down the, review, the review form and nailed the three main points that I had nailed. And it was like, I don't know who the person was, but they were good. <laughs> but you know, that, that comes with experience too. So um, I had a colleague who said that he spent no more than a re an hour with a review. And I'm like, I'm not sure that's always okay. You know, in an hour, can you actually, I mean, you're responsible for quality control in a way of the journal. And you know, you, you more than uh, the only people who will read a manuscript more closely than you, ultimately, besides the authors, will be people who are literally using that research in their own research. Right? Everybody else is just using it for background or for the general to learn about a field or something like that. It's going to skim it much more lightly than you, you're doing, or arguably, unless you spend an hour with the manuscript. And um, you know, you have a you have an obligation to do a better job than that. It seems. So how much time you spend, I think, really is a function of how important you think the, the topic is and the like. Um, but again, it's also subject to the idea that you shouldn't be, you know, if somebody sends you a paper that's not ready to be peer reviewed and, and you just need some just missing stuff and it's not coherent, just don't spend, don't waste your time and let the editors know that they should really pol be policing this. Um, one of the things you should do is try to be objective and avoid conflicts of interest. And this is, raises the issue that you raised earlier is, you know, if you have monetary or professional conflicts with the individual, just you know, or even intellectual conflicts with the internet. You know, people have disciplinary b um, battles about what what's right to do. Um, you, maybe you shouldn't do the review. And, and the, the issue is always go back to the always go back to the editors. Or if it's, a fund, if it's a funder, go back to the funder and disclose that. Years ago, I submitted a grant to the NSF, and um, they actually asked the guy I'd published papers with if he felt comfortable reviewing this manuscript. And I don't, there's this proposal, and I didn't know why they couldn't find anybody else, but. They, he said, sure, he would review it, and they just kind of like considered the fact that he had this conflict of interest, which is kind of strange by my, to me, but they did it. 
And the one thing to consider is the peer reviewers provide advice. You're just giving your advice and your insights to the editor. Everything that the editor does is his or her decision. Right. And you have to weigh that. I mean, going forward with journals, I mean, I've had several journals now, and it's like, you know, you, you essentially, you decide, you find out what you learn, what their standards for quality are, is, are, you know, what their standard is. Um, and then you decide whether or not it's worth your time in the future to review for those journals. I mean, sometimes I've, you know, I've, I've thoroughly thrashed an article, and um, it gets accepted, and it's subject to revisions, and it's like, okay, well, I know what their standard is, and maybe I don't, it's not worth my time in the future. So. Maybe a little bit obnoxious, but so, so, be it. so what is peer review? In the last 10 minutes, I'll try to give you some insights, those of you who can tell me if this is consonant with your experiences. In general, journal peer reviews, the reviews have two parts. First is a, com a confidential communication to the editor. So the, and a lot of these journals, a lot of journals will use a form. Not, a not all, science and nature don't. But it's basically, here's the things we are interested in knowing about this, this thing. And essentially what you should do on those is basically give them a recommendation for publish, or publish or reject, or you know, re publish, reject, or they, sometimes they have other categories like revise and resubmit, or major revision, minor revision kind of thing. And um, so you give them their, that feedback, and then you very briefly, in the two or three sentences if you can do it, you tell them what the strengths and weaknesses of the program. You can basically justify, as very succinctly as possible, justify your recommendations. So they can look at that and say, okay, this paper is bad because of this, or it's a great paper, publish ASAP. Right? Um, and then the second part is the non-confidential um, communication to the authors. Um, now generally, these are blinded, but a lot of journals, not a lot of the journals, some journals are moving away from the blinded peer reviews. Um, BMJ, for instance, allows you, I think, wants you to sign your, your, your peer review unless you don't want to do it. Um, JAMA, again, they don't want to see your signature in any way, and it's totally blinded. Um, you should never say in that, in that, in that co the communication to the editor, to the authors, what your recommendation about publishing or not is. Right? You don't basically don't want to undermine the editor's decision. I mean, if you, you know, I got, I submitted a paper to science some years ago and I got these glowing, not glowing reviews, very positive reviews. And at the end of the day, they rejected and they said it was, you know, yes, it was a positive, positively reviewed paper, but we just don't have room to dedicate to this topic. So and that's their discretion always to make that decision and you don't want to undermine that. Um, so these reviews typically have three parts, and not everybody does the summary, but I highly recommend that it be done. A summary is the first thing you write. You just write a couple of sentence summary, not an abstract, just a couple of summaries. This paper you know, basically does this, right? And here's their findings. Very, very short. And the reason if you do that is to make sure that you, a you read it and understand it, read it and understand it. If the editors really want a different abstract and a different take on what the paper is about. They can read that. Um, it's short and succinct, and. Um, it means that you've read it. And one of the things I've noticed is that a couple of times in my, my, my career, I've come across the, the summary statements where they didn't get it. Now, that can be because they didn't pay enough attention or because I didn't do a good job writing a manuscript, right? So it goes both ways. But at least this way, I know that there's a fundamental disconnect between me and the, and the reader. The second thing is the general critique. And this is a very high level, high level critique. So this paper is the strengths and the strengths and weaknesses of the manuscript. What are its major strengths? What are its major weaknesses? Right? And then kind of like a summary, then because of this, it's got you know, this fundamental flaw kind of thing. Right? And then finally, the specific comments. If you feel like you're doing specific comments, you go through the manuscript and you can do anything. You, you can, I mean, if it's a well-written manuscript and you want to like show those round on sentences and stuff like that, do editorial comments, you can do it. I do it sometimes if, the, if I'm interested in the manuscript and it's well-written. If it's a half-baked manuscript, I never do that. I'll just kind of like thrash it at a high level. Um, on, com, in contrast to journals, there's other things. There's book peer reviews. Book peer reviews are largely unstructured. You'll often be offered like $100 or $200 to do the book reviews. Um, review a book, not a book review, a review of a book manuscript. Um, they're really time consuming and really painful in the field. Um, and review of proposals, in contrast, is largely, at least for the NIH and other large funding agencies, is pretty formulaic. NIH provides cookbook way of kind of walking through a proposal and have what they expect to see and what they're asking for. Um, and it's, again, it's not an iterative process directly. All right, um, I'll finish it up with this. I don't know if anybody read my little, my little diatribe. Um, but Here's six points that I thought we should make. One is you thoroughly read the manuscript, right? Unless it's like, I mean, I've read manuscripts, for instance, that were written by a non-native English-speaking person, and they clearly needed that, right? And it's really hard to parse and stuff. And at that point, it's almost like, let's go back and like tell this person they just need an editor. You know, they need somebody who can rewrite this and make it understandable. Um, and that should really probably take place before it's peer-reviewed, just to make sure you're on the same page. But you need to read the paper 
right, to under, make sure you understand it. Right? And you're, like I said before, you're going you're gonna to spend much more time with this than most other readers, so why not spend the time? Right? Um, then you have to perform a thorough and critical analysis, kind of doing the things that we talked about before. Um, and, okay, that's self-explanatory. And here's one, one of the points, and you strive to be right. And one thing you should never do, and the peer reviewers had a tendency, some peer reviewers, in fact, think that their, their job is to criti criticize. Mm, no, not so much. And in some sense, I've seen peer reviewers who like, will, will paint, will, will attack broadly when they don't have any justification to it, justification for it. And so when you do attack something, make sure that you're right about the attack because you know, it kind of can gain a life of its own. So people that attacked my, that one paper I had mentioned earlier, they were wrong. You know, they were wrong about substantive facts. And so anyway, um, one thing you should also do is acknowledge your limitations. For instance, if you don't know the readership, I will get asked to review, review for journals. I don't know the readership at all. And just acknowledge the fact that you don't know who the readership is. I mean, the editors can make that call. right? Statistics, if you're not trained in statistics and you don't, you know, they're doing some kind of like really crazy stuff on a clinical trial and you're not used to that stuff, just tell the editor you didn't review for that, right? And the editors then know that they, maybe they should go get a statistical consult or something like that. And that's not a problem, that's not a limitation on you. You should also acknowledge, limit, like, do, do discuss conflicts, right? And talk about that the edit, with the editors, make sure they're on the same page. The editors also on, oftentimes on those, the communication, the confidential communication to the editors will have a conflict of interest disclosure statement. And you should be pretty frank in, in those statements. Um, finally, you should have a little humility, not finally, but almost, also you should have a little humility, right? You may be the lead, world's leading light on this, but there may be other people who are equally skilled or maybe even more skilled at this. They know, they know of what they write, right? And you know, just kind of go into it. And this, is, this speaks back to the norms of, of having respect for the work of others, right? So, and then finally, try to be nice. Anybody ever read a peer, anybody ever gotten a peer review? It is one of the next to authorship generally, and it's, it's just really painful. It can be really painful because somebody basically has kind of like written this cold thing and attacked you. You know, you, you have a tendency to take it personally. I mean, uh, everybody I know just you take it, you read it, and you set it aside for a couple days, you know, let it, let it, you know, breathe, take a couple deep breaths, so to speak, metaphorically, and, um, and then go back to it. And one of the problems is that peer reviews can be written pretty nastily. And, you know, they always said, well, run it by somebody, you know. And the, actually, the, one of the recommendations I've made and I've seen others make is, how would you feel? And you, I don't know if we could really do this because of the bias, but do, how would you feel if you got this, this review, you know, written the way it is? So this one paper, this, this, this paper that had the four reviews, well, it had three peer reviews, four peer reviews at JAMA, and then it went to social science and medicine, had another four peer reviews there. One of the reviewers literally said, these guys haven't done their homework. They don't know the literature, right? And he didn't cite anything. Right. And it turns out I know, I know, I figured out who this guy was, especially because we went back and said, you know, this is the most, he literally, I forget the, the exact language, I probably put it in that, in that review, but um, I forget the exact language he used, but it was really nasty, you know, and we, we don't know what we're talking about because we didn't cite the literature, relevant literature, and we had 80 references in that paper, and we had thoroughly recited literature. We had submitted the paper, I think, in, I don't know, like November, December time frame or something, and um, we got the reviews probably in June or July, and Social Science and Medicine is one of these two-year horror shows that you hear about. And, um, and he basically, so we went back and said, you know, this is the most obnoxious thing we've ever seen in a review. And, you know, he, he tell, doesn't even tell us what, he, what, what we missed, but nonetheless attacks us for it, right? So, the, unfortunately, this, this journal did not do what most journal, good journals do, and it's a good journal, but they didn't send the other peer reviewers, the peer reviewers, the first, the, they didn't send each peer reviewer the other peer reviewers' comments. So we responded, and, and the other peer reviewers get our complete response. And here we say, this is the most obnoxious thing we've ever seen. Right? <laughs> so one of the, the peer reviewers said, this is the best paper we've ever seen on this topic. It should, it's written well enough to go in science or nature. He, and I think I know who he is, came back and said, it made me think less of them. And I don't know what he said. I don't know what the first reviewer said, but seeing their nasty response, he didn't use that language, but it made me think less of them, right? Which just ticked me off even more. <laughs> but we also went back to the first reviewer, and the first reviewer was like, well, he missed these two papers, and it's these two papers by this anthropologist in Iceland. This is in a paper about Iceland's decode genetics project. Both papers appeared after we had submitted our manuscript. That was the, that was the kind of the cheap shot 
that was very nasty. And because the editors didn't submit it to the other reviewers, we actually took a hit with those other reviewers as well. And at the end of the day, it's like, you know, to what end? Why did you do that? So we just added cheap references to his two papers and let him, let him. But anyway, he was not nice. We were not nice in response. And we're all worse for it. Anyway, <laughs> I'll stop there.